Okay, so where we got to was um, looking at a few more definitions and um, basic descriptions and so on yesterday. So we got as far as <coughs> diamonds, basically. We looked at, uh, at atoms, we introduced some simple concepts in quantum physics, basically. Uh, we looked at isotopes and um, then we looked at ions. So now we've got to move on, and again, this is quite descriptive what we're going to get in this lecture as well we're going to start with some types of matter and then we're going to gradually move into different types of um, bonding between <coughs> atoms and at some point we'll pick up on the main crystal structure groups and that sort of thing um, but between now and then we'll, um, we'll also look at intratopic forces in more detail so let's start with types of matter um, I should probably change this <coughs> sentence a little bit. Um, it's okay technically as it reads, matter we know about. Um, those of you who read this sort of stuff will realise <coughs> there's an awful lot of matter we don't know about. Uh, huge debates about dark matter still going on um, at the moment, with potentially some early signs of, of some dark matter having been discovered. Right, so it's a relatively hot topic at the moment but it's not definitive but anyway, stuff we know about let's stick with that for now um, some prosaic divisions again, this is you know, going to be sort of falling off a log for all of you, I'm sure um, solids, liquids and gases have things in common they have things that are quite different uh, a solid is something that retains a fixed shape um, so a fixed volume in other words unless you apply pressure uh, to it the atoms are packed together relatively closely um, and they're fixed in that position right? it wouldn't be a fixed shape if the atoms weren't fixed in position now at any temperature above absolute zero the atoms are vibrating so they're moving around a little bit but they're moving around an equilibrium position and we'll talk about equilibrium positions in more detail later on. Um, a liquid is somewhat different. Uh, it's not as different as you might think at first uh, thought, in the sense that the densities of liquids are not that dissimilar from their solid counterparts. You melt a, uh, a metal, for instance, and its density doesn't change by more than 10%. Right, so it's not that different, um, which means the spacing between the atoms can't be that different. Right? The one difference is that these atoms now have sufficient thermal energy um, that they don't just vibrate around, oscillate around an equilibrium position, they actually migrate. So they move past each other. And that 10% or whatever it is reduction in, in density is enough to give the space required for atoms actually to move past each other or molecules. So now we've got something that necessarily won't hold a fixed shape. It'll take the shape of whatever container it's in. <coughs> because the atoms are sliding around, moving past each other um, and um, as it says on the slide, therefore mobile. Now a gas is a, a really quite distinct uh, um, state of matter. We've now moved the atoms, and you did this calculation yesterday, remember, or at least we looked at the results of it. A gas uh, is going to have spacing between atoms that's an order of magnitude larger than it was in the solid or the liquid. They really are spaced apart now. And actually in the simplest, we'll look at perfect gases later on, but in the simplest circumstances, uh, we're looking now at atoms that are essentially free of all other influences, right? They are just moving under the influence of whatever kinetic energy they have, right? And that will depend on their temperature. It defines their temperature. Um, so again, no fixed shape, <coughs> no fixed volume even, in the case of gas, it will just expand and expand until it reaches the boundaries of whatever container it's in. Um, 
and um, you know, as I say, very, very, very mobile uh, um, atoms. So solids and liquids have some similarities, some differences. Um, gases appear to be totally different from everything else. Well, they are certainly profoundly different. But even there, there is some similarity between a gas and a liquid in, in the sense of the mobility of the atoms. Uh, and the fact that, unlike in a, a crystalline solid, where we can predict the positions of all the atoms inside relatively accurately, um, both liquid and gas, we've got atoms where we couldn't do that from one time step to the next. Uh, the motion of, um, of atoms or molecules in a fluid, for instance, is such that if you take a snapshot at time zero, uh, things will have moved out of the memory of that first step within about 10 to the minus 13 of a second. Right? These are sort of typical room temperature type timescales for water, for instance. Uh, so, you know, they really are uh, um, mobile in a very profound sense. Now, there are other forms of matter, and you'll have heard about a lot of these, perhaps not all of them, uh, but the plasma is, is a, an ionized gas, basically, so we've got a separation now between uh, positive and negative charge components of our gas and they're called <coughs> the plasma. Neutron stars are uh, those stars that have collapsed under their own gravitational uh, pull uh, such that we only have neutrons. So in <coughs> other words, you know, putting it crudely, the electrons and the protons have you know, combined to produce neutrons. So the only thing we've got left is neutrons. So now this is something that has the density of the nucleus of an atom, but is relatively uh, large. Um, a black hole takes it a little bit further than that. We're now talking about a gravitational uh, potential that is so strong that, by definition, that's why it's called a black hole, uh, light uh, is not going to escape from the, uh, from the object. Um, and as you may or may not know, there are supposed to be a great many black holes uh, around in the universe. In fact, there is a theory that says every galaxy has at least one black hole. Right? And the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, has pretty much been tied down in position there uh, from, from recent studies. Um, and then there are other rather peculiar states of matter things like these Bose-Einstein condensates, uh, which is essentially a form of matter that you've cooled down so far that you've, in essence, taken out all or almost all of its thermal energy. So there is no vibration going on. Particles are now sitting um, at the zero energy state. Uh, it's a rather, rather bizarre form of matter, and as you can appreciate, actually very hard to, um, uh, to produce. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, moving between one and another state, again, is a common occurrence. Right? We've all seen it in ice turning to water, <coughs> and water turning to steam, and back again. Excuse me. Two lectures in a row is obviously still too much. Um, but it, it's always involved in, the, in, uh, in energy, either energy going into a system or energy coming out of the system. So if we take the example of, uh, uh, of ice, for instance, turning to water, that involves us putting energy into the ice for that to happen. And you know what we're doing is relatively easy to conceptualize. We're putting in energy so that our molecules are no longer simply vibrating around fixed positions, but now have sufficient energy to slide past each other. That's the melting point. That's the point at which our fixed shape, fixed volume solid, uh, becomes something that has no fixed shape um, and will adopt whatever the the shape of its container is. And going from the liquid to the gas is the same thing. We've just got to put more energy in. 
but now we're putting in energy that breaks whatever attractive forces there are between the atoms and the molecules in the liquid such that they can fly apart and form a gas. Okay, so at both stages we're just putting energy in. And actually if you wanted to turn your gas into a plasma we're talking about putting in even more energy. Now you need enough energy for at least one of the electrons in our gas to be removed from the atom, so we end up with positive charges and negative charges. Right, and that's what's happening in fluorescent tubes, for instance. In that case, we're putting the energy in in terms of the electric potentials. Um, and we'll look at that sort of process later on uh, in this module. But we can go the other way, of course. We can go from a gas, so <coughs> steam, say, to a liquid, water, to a solid, ice. And in order to do that, we need to take energy out. Right? So in the case of water, we talk about reducing its temperature, where the temperature is just a measure of the kinetic energy uh, of the water molecules inside the steam or the water or the ice that we're, we're looking at. <coughs> so if we take energy out, we'll, we'll, we'll condense the gas into a liquid. The molecules will no longer have sufficient energy to stay independent of one another. Um, and if we take more energy out, our water will freeze uh, into ice. Right? The molecules will not be able to move around anymore. And then we get things, uh, relatively <coughs> complex things that can happen on this thing called phase diagram. Now you don't need to pay incredible attention to this. I'm putting it in because it's probably quite useful for you to see one of these things. Um, you won't need to use one in anger for some considerable time, I suspect. Um, but it's just a plot of the state of whatever your system is, uh, one variable against another. So in this case, pressure is being uh, plotted against temperature. All right, so if this is water, for instance, um, we've got, um, depending on our pressure, <coughs> We've got water vapor, so you know the steam state, we've got a liquid state, and we've got a solid state of ice. But it will depend on both pressure and temperature. All right? You'll probably all appreciate that it's impossible to make a decent cup of tea at the top of a high mountain range because the water won't boil at 100 degrees C, it boils at something lower than that. I used to live in a previous job I had um, at an altitude of about two and a half thousand meters. And the boiling point of water there was a little over 96 degrees centigrade, not 100 now. It was also in the United States, so it's actually impossible to make tea anyway. <laughs> but, sorry. Um, but it's a real effect. Okay, same thing, actually the same place I lived, the snow is fantastic. The snow is fantastic because uh, it doesn't go through the melting stage. It doesn't produce the nasty, slushy stuff that we get in the UK. It goes direct <coughs> from the icy stage to vapour. It doesn't pass through the liquid stage. So basically, we've been able to transfer <coughs> across that line somewhere down here. We haven't had to, oh sorry, I should go that way. <coughs> we haven't had to go through the liquid state because the pressure has been reduced. So actually the winters were quite beautiful. They were always either white and fluffy or sunny and dry. Fantastic. But <coughs> you really have to think about pressure and temperature. All right, and then for water and a lot of other things as well, you have peculiar points like here. So for water, there is something called the triple point. And if you get the pressure and the temperature just right, you can get liquid, solid, and gas all simultaneously in your test tube. And they will be moving interchangeably between each state. All right? And there are a lot of things other than water that have uh, that have things like um, like triple points. So that's just an introduction. <coughs>